Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Broken. Probably. Hello, hello. Hey. Now you can hear my sweet, sweet voice, right? I'm not singing harmony any with, with Asa, that's for sure. Everyone doing good? Yeah. I thought it was going to be a little cooler when we got up in the morning. Holy hot dogs. <laughs> hey, uh, listen up, everybody. Um, we're a Bible church, and so just because we're out in the parking lot doesn't mean we don't want to have our Bibles. So Amen. we're going to get a, a word from God's word this morning. And so if you don't have a Bible with you, let me see those holy people with Bibles with them. Let me see them Bibles. Yeah, that's good. That's good. If you don't have a Bible, look over here. Hey, Miss Paula, raise your hand right there. Raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Right behind us, a big pile of Bibles. Who needs a Bible? Yeah. Kevin's going to go get one, and Mike's going to hand him out if you need a Bible. Because you can't read Romans chapter 6, right, without a Bible, can you? Did you guys come to hear from me this morning to hear from God? Yeah. You need a Bible then, right? Hey, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah. Christ is risen. Yes, he has. Christ is risen. Christ has risen. Hey, I'm just excited to be out here this morning. I'm, I'm thrilled that, uh, that there's some folks out there still that are uh, still willing to come out and, and gather as God's word informs us to do so. And it says that we are to not forsake the assembly. There's no, I, you know, I, I don't know what Bible you have. I have a, a New Living Translation and I've, I've read that, that verse in Hebrews 10.25 and I've never seen a little asterisk next to it that says, except when. Do you guys have that in your Bible? I don't have that. Show me if you have that in your Bible. Do you have that in your Bible? I don't have that in my Bible. So we're here, and I'm just glad that you are here. And for those of us that couldn't make it because, uh, you know, we're sick, we're out of town, uh, we're on Facebook Live right now. So I'm glad that you could join us that way as well. So glad we're here. Uh, if you've never been here before, I just want to welcome you to Revolution Church. Just in case you need to know, uh, just a little housekeeping. Uh, if you need to use the little boys room or little girls room just uh, go straight through that door right there and go straight through the sanctuary and just keep on going and if you keep going straight eventually you're going to trip over a toilet okay hey hey did you guys know something did you guys know that i play center for the boston celtics did you know that no no i really i really do no, i i think i do i i feel like i do did you didn't know that no, no, I really, really do. And also, hey, did you guys know that I got my uh, master's degree from Harvard in bioinformatics and integrative genomics? Did you know that? That's less believable. No, I really did. Honestly, I really, really did. You don't think so, huh? No, I did. I did. Oh, and uh, by the way, this one might surprise you um, if you've known me for quite some time. But I feel very attracted to men, and so I think that God made me a woman. And so I'm not Moses anymore. I am... Now, Monique. <laughs> that was the one that you weren't supposed to laugh at. But whether you think that some of them are funny or not, some of those, one of those that I just mentioned is something that's commonly heard in our world. Not very funny. Well, clearly all of these things, whether they're funny or not, they all are examples of something that points to this one thing. And that is that feelings and thoughts and opinions and what people say don't decide the truth. Okay, they don't decide the truth. None of those things are a truth standard. When everyone does what is right in their own eyes, there's actually a word for that, that's not freedom. It's called anarchy. And when people do what's right in their own eyes, there's never anything good before that or after it. And you can open up the Bible and you can see story after story when people did what was right in their own eyes and see the chaos that ensued. It's never good for a people. Now there's one person that lived and he boldly said, and his name is Jesus, that I am the truth. He said, I am the truth. He said that in John chapter 14. And so what we do is we use God's word, his word. Jesus Christ said, I'm the truth. And this is his word. So we use his word as our truth standard in all things. And so just like me saying I play for the Celtics is easily proven wrong by a quick glance at the truth. Just go to 
Celtics.com and look at their roster and find out that I'm not on it. <laughs> and just like a quick peek at, see, I brought this thing out just because I really wanted to impress you guys. Um, Andersonville Theological Seminary is not Harvard. So, so just a quick glance at what hangs on my little wall in my little closet of an office will tell you real quick the truth. The truth is, is this is where I graduated with a, with a bachelor's degree in biblical studies. I'm not a Harvard graduate, right? And so it is with Christ's resurrection. We look into the word of Christ to find truth as it pertains to your life as a Christian. We're not here just to celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead, which is, this is going to be a great place for an amen. Are you ready? We're not here just to celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead, because that's awesome. Amen. That was amen. decent. Amen. But we're here to, to acknowledge and celebrate what that resurrection means to you. Amen. Because if it's just to celebrate what he did, like that's awesome. I'm not taking any credit away from him. But if that's all we celebrate and it doesn't have any impact on your life, what is, does it really matter? doesn't really matter so are you a Christian yes. have you acknowledged your sin yes. have you acknowledged the fact that your sin has separated you from a holy and perfect God and that you cannot fix that problem on your own yes. and have you acknowledged your sin and apologized for your sin and have you bent the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord of your life have you turned from your sin embraced Christ by faith and made him the Lord and Savior of your life. Have you repented? Have you turned? Have you been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Now listen, if this is you, then you are now, as the scriptures say, you are now in Christ, right? If anyone is in Christ, the old has died. Behold the new man. Okay? That means the things that used to define who you are are no longer. Okay? That person is dead. That person is dead. Okay? Colossians 3 4 takes it an extra step. It says that not only are you in Christ, but this is where I think people fail to embrace this. Let's embrace this this morning. You ready to embrace something? Okay. Colossians 3 4 says, Christ is your life. Now, listen, listen, loved ones, I love you, I'm not here to condemn, but measure your life, what you think, what you do, what you say, everything about you. We know the truth that says Christ is your life, but is he? Don't say yes so quick. Think about what you do. See, we're here to embrace truth this morning. We're here to embrace truth. And since you're in Christ, and Christ is the truth, then what's the truth about his resurrection for you? And so I want to have us turn our attention to Romans chapter 6 this morning. If you have a Bible, even if you have one of them fake Bibles on your phone, you can use that too. <laughs> Romans chapter 6 is the most highly concentrated teaching on the resurrection, not just on the resurrection itself, but on what it means, its impact on you. If you go to the Gospels, you're going to see historic information about Jesus Christ resurrecting. We're going to see historic documentation, eyewitness accounts of people that actually saw Jesus get whipped and beaten and staked to a cross and die and get buried and then rose again. That's historic information. We know that to be true. But what we see in Romans chapter 6 is a little bit more practical. What we see in Romans chapter 6 is not only that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, but what that means for you. So it's not just historic things that we're celebrating here this morning, but it's practical things that we're celebrating. Now as you turn to Romans chapter 6, I want to say what I'm often fond of saying, and that is this, that if you're a Christian then the word of God, at some point, the word of God must carry more weight in your life than what you think or feel. Amen. You understand? Amen. At some point, and I don't know if it's happened yet, but at some point, the word of God must have more weight in your life than what you think or what you feel. Amen. So let me explain what I'm talking about. 
Is lying wrong? Show your hands. Show your hands. Do you think lying is wrong? Yeah. You do? Okay. Why? What? Okay. But greater than that? Jesus said so. Jesus said so. The word of God says that lying is wrong. And we're not to do it. Do you all acknowledge that? Well, what if I... Let's just ask, let me ask you this. What if you feel like it was okay to just lie a little bit, considering the circumstances, you know, you want to protect someone. It's not a big lie, but just a little white lie because you feel like the circumstances call for it. Is, is that wrong? Yes. Why? Come on, let's all say what he said. Jesus said so. The word of God says that lying is wrong. How about adultery? Is it wrong? Yes. Is it wrong for me to cheat on Meredith? Yes. Okay. Why? Jesus said so. Love says no, don't do that. But the word of God, above love for my wife, which there's much. I love you. But the word of God says no. But let me ask you this. What, what if Meredith just isn't very nice to me and doesn't take care of all that I want and I feel lonely and unengaged and there's just this other lady and she's nice and she's, she cares about me and we have great conversations and she listens to me and she's super pretty and she thinks some crazy reason she thinks I'm a hunk and I think God wants me to be happy and my friends tell me I only go around once and I deserve to get a dog. Is it okay then? Uh, why? Because God's word says no. And so his word carries more weight than what we think or feel. So let's do this. Let's read from Romans chapter 6. And let's see what God's truth says about the resurrection and what it means to you. Okay? Romans chapter 6 starting in verse one. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Maybe we could all, let's all, let's all do this. Let's all participate in the sermon this morning. I'm gonna ask the question, you answer it, you ready? Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now also we may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we all, will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. That was a good place for an amen too, amen. church. Come on now. Amen. All the Pentecostal people out there, raise your hand. Help the rest of them, please. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. Amen. It's a little better. And he will never die again. Amen. Die, death, there we go. We're starting to get it. Amen. Death no longer has any power over him. Amen. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Amen. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Amen. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely. Someone say completely. Completely, completely to God. For you Amen. were dead, but now you have new life. So Amen. use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Amen. Sin is no longer your master, and you Amen. no longer live under the requirements of the law. Amen. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Amen. 
Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that, here we go again. I'm going to ask the question, you give me the answer. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Absolutely. Don't you realize that you can become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery, to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. Amen. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. Things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Amen. Now... You do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. The free gift of God is eternal life Amen. through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I think we can all agree that what God has done for us is beyond incredible. Yes. But at the same time, I hope that as I was reading that and you were reading it with me, that you sensed the chasm between what this says you should be and the way you're living, myself included. <clears throat> Let's take another vote. How many people think, show of hands, that Romans chapter 6 is the truth? Amen. Unanimous, huh? Oh, there we go. I want to make sure Steve got All right, good. <laughs> Did you raise your hand back there? Come on, all right, just making sure. How about you back there? Okay. Come on, two hands. <laughs> Roger gets a pass. So listen, if we all believe that Romans chapter six is true, then according to what I said earlier, just in theory, it will carry more weight than what we think or feel, correct? Yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, so here's the first truth I want you to embrace this morning. A Christian truly is a new person. Truly is a new person. Look at uh, verses three and four. Look back. Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, you joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Okay? So, so listen, when you get saved, you get baptism, and they get baptized and all that stuff, and I hope that all of you have done that. I hope you've given your life to Christ and gone under the water in the, in the tank and, and get baptized. I hope that you've done all that. But when you do all that, when you get saved, you get baptized, all that, it's not just some religious ceremony. It's not just some rite of passage that you invite your family to, and then you go to Golden Corral afterwards and say, well, that's really, really neat. Here, let's, let's embrace some truth. Truth is this, is that when you repented of your sin, that means you acknowledge your sin, you apologize for your sin, you have turned from your sin, you have now turned to God, and now the Holy Spirit resides inside of you, and now you are born again. And at that point, what's been initiated is a new life. And so old Moses, with all of my old regrets, and all of my old standards, and all of my old priorities, and all of my perspectives that used to be, and all of my past sin, and all of these old things that used to identify who I was is dead. Hallelujah. It's dead. And now, and, and just as Christ has been raised, so am I, right? I'm a new man. Amen. I'm a new man, okay? The old has died. Behold, right? Look. Look at me. I'm new. Amen. I'm not the same person I used to be. When you get saved, it's right. It's just like a. It's like a funeral. We, how many people have gone to a funeral? You been to a funeral, right? Yeah. When you go to a funeral, what happens? That that person's in the box, right? That person no longer exists. Amen. 
The difference is, is, but we're just like a funeral here and we get saved. That person doesn't exist, but unlike an earthly funeral, our eternal funeral means we've died, but now we're raised to new life. So we're a funeral and a birthday at the same time. That's what salvation really is. A new person. So when you get saved, you're not just like a better version of you. Right? You're not just, it's not just like a, some would teach like a self-realization of what is like, okay, I, I figured it out now. Like God has told me who I am. And so now I can kind of figure that out and I can manage that and get better. And no, I'm dead. I'm dead. Okay. No more. I don't exist. I'm brand new. That means on a practical level that those things that I used to be, you can't hold me to them anymore. That means that the things you used that used to identify you, I can't hold them against you anymore, Christ follower. Amen. Okay, we need to let our, our brothers and sisters out of the jail that we put them in. On, okay, those Amen. things are dead and buried. Okay, so listen, and at the same time, I can't keep looking back on my past and identifying myself of, of who I was. And the same is for you. Whatever You all did so much crap in your life. Don't leave me up here. You did so much. We should all be going to hell, right? I mean, let's just all be honest in church, right? Every one of us should go straight to the pit. But you don't get to go to the pit. So listen, you cannot keep looking in the rearview mirror at your past crap and dragging it into your present because it'll kill your future. You can't do that anymore, okay? The old person has died. Behold, that means you see it. Behold. There's a new person. Sin doesn't turn me on anymore. Sin doesn't excite me anymore. Sin doesn't own me anymore. And what used to excite me and used to draw me in is now disgusting in my eyes. And I can see it clearly for what it is. I thought it was helpful, but I realize it's hurtful. That's what sin is. I, say this with me, I am new. I am new. I am new. Okay? L please, loved ones, let Easter 2020 not just be, hey, this is kind of neat. They did it outside. Let it, I beg you, let it be a turning point in your life. The old has died. Behold the new man. Okay? That's what we're looking for. Now, all of this is super good news so far. It's all super good news. So all you need to do is believe in Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross for your sin. Listen, and if this belief is and this trust is real, if it's legit, I mean like legit down deep inside of your guts, then the old you has died to sin's power. And you're a new person alive to God. The Bible says in Ephesians 1.13 that when you believed, not some future time. When you believed, God gave you his Holy Spirit. He lives inside of you. And that's what makes you alive to God. And that's why the Bible would say that we're living by the Spirit. It's that, this is the mind blow. Are you ready? It's the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Amen. That lives in you. Amen. Right? That's insanity, right? Now listen. Think about that for a second. Let's just have a little chat. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, 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 just go right up and down the aisle. There's a lot of people right here right now, right? If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in all of us, and what Romans chapter 6 says, if it's true, then shouldn't a bunch of people like that, shouldn't it be tangible? Shouldn't it be visible, the difference? Shouldn't it be powerful? Shouldn't it change the world? Come on, get fired up, church. Don't just stand there and look at me. Seriously, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in all of us, shouldn't that be visible? Shouldn't people see it? Shouldn't it change the world around us? Dormant. We can't be dormant. Listen, have you ever noticed that there's no shortage of churches here? Yeah. There's tons of stinking churches around here, right? Tons of them. Right. Hundreds of them. But the thing that blew me away when I first became a Christ follower and still blows me away to this day 
But even though there's church after church after church after church after church, I see people in this group right now that go to three or four churches every single week. There's tons of churches. Let me ask you, if what we see is true, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in all of these believers and there's all of these churches, and it should be powerful and tangible, how much Christian cultural impact do we see here? Got quiet, quick, didn't it? Not a whole lot, right? Like I, I always, I remember way back in the day when I, let me see who, I've probably known B and Peter, the longest here. When I first got saved, I was working at Advantage Chrysler, selling cars, sold them a couple of cars, I guess. And uh, we made friends and I noticed something way back then. I became a Christian back then. And I noticed something then and it still exists today. I realized like there's so many, okay. <laughs> so all these customers come in, right? I'm selling cars for a long time. And when the customer comes in, you always talk to them about like if you saw a bumper sticker on their car, if they were from Michigan or they were in, had an army stick or something, you start talking about that. You got to have some common ground so you could just take them to the cleaners, right? That's what they did. That's just, we're trying to be honest in church, right? So, so I used to make conversation with people and I started asking them like, where are you from? And they'd be like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Ohio, da, 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 right? No one's from here. And I would ask them, I'd say, well, what brings you down to like, because they'd live in Mount Dora, Tavares, Eustis, Leesburg, right here, you know? I'm like, well, what brought you down here? And this is Lake County, right? There's tons of golf courses and lakes. Like, that's the whole thing here. That's, what, that's the attraction, right? But nobody would say that. You know what they all said? That's where we think God wants us. I'm like, what? What's wrong with these people? You know? And it just kind of blew me away. I was like, what? I don't, I don't get it. So, so God moved all these people, his people, to this area. And there's tons of churches, but very, very weak signal, right? You have, a, you have a, an inter, internet signal that's kind of weak. Very weak signal for Christianity in our community. Not nearly what it should be when you compare what it is to what we just read, right? It may, there's churches, including our own, that make an impact and, and we help people and, we, and when people get saved and get baptized, we feed homeless folks and help people with their electric bills. I get it. But when you read what it says in God's word, what we should be, and you see how many churches there are, and there's not this massive, tangible, powerful impact upon a community, I start wondering, like, what's going on here? It just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I think I skipped a whole page of my notes. It did. Why didn't you tell me that? Did you hold on? No, I didn't want to distract. <laughs> I think the problem that we're experiencing is that we haven't embraced the fact that we are new people. Right. And I think that we have a problem, and that is also that sin isn't supposed to control us anymore. And so statements like, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way God made me. My ethnicity says this. My, my, my community says that. That's why I'm Italian. I'm Irish. I'm Jewish. This is where we are, right? Statements like these may identify the dude who died with Christ, but it doesn't identify the new person, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so listen, look, look at verse six and look at verse six and seven in, in the word. Uh, we, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin for when we died with Christ, we are, we were set free from the power of sin. So listen, I think there's some power in your declaration. I think there's some, when you, when I know when a person says something, it usually carries a lot more weight and has some lasting power. So bring something up on the screen for me, Xavier. Can you bring that up? Which one? Right there. I want you to repeat this with me three times out loud. You ready? What does it say? I am no longer a slave to sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. I am no longer a slave to sin. 
Listen, the reason why we can say that with confidence is not that sin isn't powerful. It's not that sin isn't everywhere. It's not that the temptation to sin doesn't present itself every single day to the Christ follower. But the scriptures that we just read right there in verse 11, look at it. What does it say? So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ. It's not that sin is dead. It's not that sin isn't everywhere. It's that you're dead to it. Right. And it's hard to, 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 to manage outside influence. You can't make, no one's going to shut down pornography, but you can shut down you, yep. right? Yeah. No one's going to make drugs empty out of Leesburg, but you can, you can be dead to using them. Right. See, you can, you can manage yourself because the Holy Spirit is inside of you. So you can manage that, but you cannot it manage the outside influences. So we need to have a funeral and then a birthday, okay? And then a birthday. So since we're dead to sin and we're not the same anymore, I'm thinking that we should have a greater Christian impact on our culture, okay? And here, here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem. Now we're, we're, we're seeking truth, right? We're seeking truth, not that we think or feel, Forget the way you used to live. Just This is your first day of your life. Look at verse 20 of our, of our text. Look at it says. It says this. When you were slaves to sin, so that's what you used to be, you were free from the obligation to do right. You were free from the obligation. The New King James would just say, you're free from that. That's what you used to be. But now, verse 19 says, you're a slave of righteousness. And verse 22 says, you're a slave of God. And so, since we used to be free from the obligation to do right, but now we're a slave of righteousness and a slave of God, then the third truth is that we are under obligation to God and to his righteousness. Amen. We are under obligation. So the question I have for you is, have you personally chosen to fulfill this obligation that God has presented to you? Have you fulfilled the obligation? That's no, churches don't like to say that kind of stuff, right? It says that when you were a slave of sin, you were free from the obligation. But if you're a Christ follower, you're not free from the obligation anymore, right? I'm not making any of this up. It's just right in there, right? Yeah. And so we have to make some decisions. We have to make some choices. Have you chosen to fulfill this obligation? See, wouldn't it be nice? I was talking to someone the other day. They were saying, man, wouldn't it be nice that when you came up out of the tank, not only are you a new person, reality, but practically you just totally acted differently. Like everything that, you, that God wants you to be, that all of a sudden that's just what you were. Then that be awesome. I'm in on that Christianity, yes. except it doesn't exist. Okay. And, and the reason why it doesn't exist, we see it right here. See, a lot of people will teach you that God's doing everything. God's doing everything. God's doing everything. Just sit there and wait on the Lord. <laughs> now, I understand on waiting on the Lord. I've had to wait on, on the Lord on lots of stuff. Amen. Still waiting. But look at verse four. What does it say? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Verse 6 says that sin might lose its power. Verses 12 and 13. Don't let sin control the way that you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. So you see that there's some things that you have to choose to do, isn't it? There's lots of choices that we have to make. Look at verse 16. This is, the, this is it right here. This is the bullseye of the, of the resurrection message right here. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Amen. We make the choice. Well, I thought God was sovereign. He is. 
And in his sovereignty, he decided to give this portion of his universe to you. He decided that. He decided to give you the choice to either obey him or obey sin. And the choice is yours. Is it an easy choice? No. It's not an easy choice. But this is tough. But look at the last sentence of verse 19. What does it say? Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living. Amen. See, it says earlier, it says you were a slave to sin. You were a slave to impurity. And you were a slave to lawlessness. But now you're a slave to righteous living. Now you're a slave of God. And because of that, you must, God says, save people are obligated. You're obligated to make this choice. How many people in this parking lot right now like to be told what to do? My God, yes. I don't even like that half the time. I mean, I'm just being honest. But God says saved people are obligated. But here's the thing. As difficult as it might be to, to make the choice to be different, you have help. See, when you get saved, you get power. Acts 1.8 says that when, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And see, it's this Holy Spirit living inside of you that makes you alive to God. And it's the same Spirit's power that's made available to you that allows you to choose some things. Okay? Remember verse 16. That's it. Don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? The choice is ours. The choice is yours as to who you will obey. And the watching world is doing just that. They are watching you to see if you will be different. They're watching to see if Christ in you actually makes a difference. They're watching you to see if the Christ in you makes it so inviting that they want to be a part of what you are. Amen. They're watching you. You Listen, I'm often fond of saying that Christ was the visible image of the invisible God. But now that Christ has ascended to heaven, you are now the visible image of the risen of the of this of the heavenly Christ. Amen. Right? Amen. They see you, they see him. And so you're the attraction model that brings people into the kingdom of God. And so they need to see something different. And look, if you follow into our on our text, verse 16 says, whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. And look at verse 17. This is I I hope that this. Easter 2020, that this next verse is going to be you. It says, thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. See, they, these people made the choice to obey God by wholeheartedly obeying the teaching of the apostles. It's this right here. They, they wholeheartedly Accepted it, submitted to it, obeyed it. And, and the watching world can see that. Now, let me ask you a question. What about you? I think everyone here is probably, I'm just going to go on a limb and say you're, you say you're Christian. And I say that too. But are you wholeheartedly obeying the teachings of the apostles? Are you doing that? It's decision time. If you're a Christian, then the resurrection of Christ means your old life has died with Christ and you're a new person in Christ. That's the truth. And so now we're under obligation as a person in Christ to obey the teachings found in God's word. And since... Here's the good news. Since Christ will never die again, neither will you. The Bible says in John 11, 25, that anyone who believes in me will live even after they die. Amen. Soapbox. Bible there. I'm here. 
Isn't that the message that this world needs to see and hear more than hide in your house? Isn't that the essence of the gospel? Doesn't the, a, a world filled with fear need to see a fearless church? A group of people that realize that no matter what comes my way, I'm good. Right? Overwhelming victory is mine in Christ. If I live, it's for Jesus. If I die, I get to be with him. So either way, it's a win-win. What are we hiding in our houses for? Right? That's what the world needs to see. Wait, wait, wait. So what's wrong with you? You're not afraid of dying? Well, no. If I die, I don't have to pay my mortgage anymore. What's the problem? Right? I mean, if, right, in, in heaven, there's no more sickness, no more death, no more fear, no more tears, right? no more fighting, no more nothing bad. No more corona. So, so, and everyone loves it. I want to go to heaven, just not today. What are you, crazy? It's the best. That doesn't mean we want to rush off and go there because there's, there's two-thirds of the world that don't know what you know yet. Right. So with them in mind, not yourself, and protecting yourself, we need to live fearless lives. If I die, I live. Right? That's the resurrection. If I die, I live. And the world needs to see that. So my plea with you this morning is let's be resurrected people. Right? Let's be resurrected people. Slaves to God. Slaves to righteous, holy living. Be new. Be new. And let's let this new life shine before men. So that God can receive the glory. So that God's kingdom would grow. It says in the scriptures that a, a growing population is the king's glory. Amen. That's what we're here for. To advance the kingdom of God. Everything was made by him and for him. Amen. So we need to move, church. Listen, we need to move from believe to practice. I think the reason why the church doesn't impact our community we have we have hundreds of churches here and the reason why our signal's so weak is not because of a lack of belief it's because of a lack of practice it's because of a lack of obligation to follow christ we're so easily swayed and we give ourselves over to so many other things that are not of god and the world doesn't see that much of a difference between us and themselves and there's really no attraction there we're not weak because we don't believe. We're weak because we don't practice. Listen, loved ones, the scriptures say that it's by his mighty power at work in you that he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. It's by his power at work in you that he advances his kingdom. And I know many, I know practically all of you here and through all the stages of the, the, the ministry that God has given the opportunity to, to be a part of, you've all been in different seasons, it seems like here. And, some, and, and it's weird, like, you guys just keep coming back. I love you. But, but different seasons, different seasons of, of my ministry. And, and every single one of you, I know it, I've had these conversations with you, and we all say the same thing. Don't you so badly want to see God just move powerfully in this community? Yeah. I mean, we all do so bad. We all pray it. We all somewhat practice it. But we still haven't seen it. We still haven't seen it. We got tons of churches, tons of Christ followers, but not a lot of Christian impact on our community. And I just want to plead with you this morning. If you've bent the knee to Christ and his spirit lives in you, then I plead with you this morning to do your part as a new person in Christ to once and for all live for him. That Jesus Christ would not just be as Colossians 3 says, Christ is your life, that it's no longer a Bible verse. But it's actually the story of your life. That's what we need. We need people who, I've been saying this for years, it's our little thing here we always say. We need people who would just open it, read it, and do it. And, and listen, if we would just do that, people ask me sometimes, what's the, why do you change the name of the church to revolution? What's the, you know, when you think of the word revolution, you think of this big change, right? 
Something big is coming. What's the big change? The big change is that I just want to be part of a church that actually does what that book says. That's it. Like, that's it. This book is in all the churches in town, including this one. But I just tell you, I'm not picking on any other church. I pick on ours, too. I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> we, I, us, we don't live this way. Right. And, and if we could just live this way, all your hopes, your dreams, your prayers about God moving powerfully in this community, all those people that you love and you, love and you pray for them and you want them to be saved, you want our schools to be different. You want the, the climate in our environment here to be different. When they drive through, right? I used to say, when they drive through, it's almost like they should, when they drive through this area, people visiting, they'd just be like, ooh, what is that? You know what I mean? You know that they'd, give, they'd get the holy eebie-jeebies. Like, what's going on around here? Like, they'd almost sense something here, right? And, and if, if God has brought so many people here and they don't understand why just God wanted us here maybe it's time to be a resurrected people and maybe it starts with just this group of people right here that make a choice a powerful choice right now to live under the obligation to live for Christ and that Christ is is their life Amen. and maybe if we would do that we could be that city on a hill where people could see this place and see these people and, and see that there was hope and there was something different. And they drove through and they said, whoa, what is this? And they just came and they found out. And we shared the beauty of the gospel with them and they just got saved in droves. So that's what we all want. And the only way that that's going to happen is if each and every one of us make the powerful quality choice to live for him. So are you here just to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? That's a good thing, right? Awesome. Or are you also here to acknowledge your resurrection? So in closing, I just want to say this. My guess, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but my guess is that this is probably not your first Easter service. I'd, I'd venture to say that many of you, if not all of you, even went to an Easter service last year. But in so doing, did you become new? I'm glad no one said yes. Because it means that God's working on you right now. And he's working on me right now. So, Asa, wherever you are, if you want to come up and join me up here. So is this a, is this a good service? Yeah. What, no. I love you guys. Is this a good service or is this a turning point? Is, is, is. Could you, would you leave here and, and say to your family and friends, well, that was nicely done. That was pretty cool. They were in the parking lot and the sun was coming up and the birds were chirping and that was kind of nice. Or was it a funeral? And at the same time, was it a birthday party? Because that's what God's looking for this morning. Amen. Right? Don't, listen, loved ones, don't wait till next Easter to, to come again and hear it figure out a, another way to do this and what does the preacher have to say today and that was fun and that was nice let's have more people at next year awesome but who knows what with what's going on i mean christ might come back before that we have another chance to gather for easter i don't know so will you choose today to have your funeral will you choose today to have your birthday will you do your part to increase the signal of Christ in this community so that once and for all, 
when people come here, they witness a resurrected people. Not just people who call themselves Christians and go to church on Sunday. It's so bad now, most of them aren't even doing that. Will you stand up and fight for what is right? Will you give yourself over to Christ once and for all? Can we have the funeral? Amen. Can we have the funeral? Amen. And can we have the birthday? Yeah. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And since Christ was raised from the dead, so have you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Father, I just want to... Um, I want to stop and shut my mouth is what I need to do. Lord, how, how, how can we, how can we possibly thank you? Like, I know we start off most of our prayers with thank you. How can we possibly thank you for who you are and what you've done for us in your death in your resurrection in your gift of the Holy Spirit living in us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead how can we possibly say thank you words don't do it and I know we're supposed to offer you our thanks and so we do that now we verbally are thanking you but there's no way that's enough I'm thankful Lord for the reminder in your word there in Romans 6 that our thank you should be choosing to live under the obligation of living for you we thank you, Lord, that what we think and what we feel honestly means nothing. That what you say is truth. And what you say is that anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. That the old has died. Behold the new man. And if we are new, let us live anew. Help us, Lord, where we fail in that way. Help us to realize that strength that's inside of us. Your Holy Spirit that gives us the power to choose. Your word says, so we know that it's true, that it is you that gives us the will and the desire to do what pleases you. Help us to tap into that power every day. That your manifest presence may be tangible in our community. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would pour out upon this and every Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching church in this community. Pour out your Spirit and let revival come to this community and to this nation. Help us to be truth people. Help us to be new people in Christ. And now, Lord, as we Take a moment to receive offering here at the church. Help us to be kingdom-minded givers. Part of living as new people is to change how we invest, change our perspective. What do we have that we have not been given by you? And so now we want to hear from you for a moment of quiet. As I get quiet and let you speak, I pray that you would teach us all, tell us all, what kingdom giving looks like and help us to give accordingly. Lord, we're listening to you.